Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Refresh. Welcome to Bali, Indonesia, for the high-level leaders meeting on global multi-stakeholder environment, achieving a safe, secure, and tolerant cyberspace, enabling growth and sustainable development with cyber ethics on 21st October 2015. This high-level leaders meeting on global multi-stakeholder collaboration for achieving a safe, secure, and tolerant cyberspace, enabling growth and sustainable development with cyber ethics will be chaired by Mr. Ashwin Sasongo, Director General of ICT Application from the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology of the Republic of Indonesia, and Mr. Kaiwola Rami, Senior Advisor for Technology to the Minister of Communication and Information Technology of the Republic of Indonesia. The sound is not working, and we already start. The file already. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me welcome to all of you. Today, we will start the high level leaders meeting together and discuss what is of issue on services. To give more value for our society. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Cyberspace has presented opportunities for development and adjustment of life. It has generated vital contributions to security users and produce growth and economic development. Therefore, rapid expansion of technology and cyberspace may create challenges to describe the individuals, societies, and the nations, and may lead to tensions and control conflicts. It is in this context, promotion and implementation of privacy, respect for cultural and regional values become more and more relevant to the press, particularly when it touches the level of sovereignty yeah. and protection of right. public interest. Yeah. By recognizing the wider yeah. of cyberspace on freedom of expression, individuals, peoples, communities, yeah. and nations, we need to raise the exception of value of respect and tolerance. Ya, jangan dulu di, jangan dulu ditulis C uh, double slash streamnya. Tulis aja IGF IGF 2013 untuk seterusnya. Nanti di bawahnya kan tulisan bros tuh. Di atas di, di atas tulisan save save file tuh. Ini enggak, jangan dulu, jangan dulu, jangan dulu ditulis si double slash stream. Tulis aja dulu IGF 2013. Nah, uh -huh. ini. Iya. Uh, itu dalam untuk, untuk untuk selanjutnya tetap cuma uh, C streamnya itu di jangan dulu diisi ntar terus baru ya. Iya, iya, iya. Video already all. Video all, but audio only. Kan IGF ni untuk terus di bawah cari C baru stream baru ada C stream. Hello. Uh -uh. Tulis aja dulu IGF 2013 Open Session dia sudah dan seterusnya itu tetap. Masa sih di sini mau kok? Mau. Di main hall. Ada. 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 Now I would like to start with the sessions by inviting His Excellency, Mr. Dima Tosabi, Minister of Communications and Information Technology, Republic of Indonesia, to the podium to give your message. Your Excellency, please.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace and prosperity to us all. Ini masih nggak konek loh, USB nya bisa bilang bapaknya bilang bilangnya ini belum selesai saya ke ruangan yang lain nggak masuk begini oh dia masuk tapi videonya masuk soalnya lainnya beda kan Indonesia Oh, 
aplikasi Hmm. Soalnya kalau misalnya kita lihat uh, capture card-nya uh, videonya dia jalan uh, terinstall cuma audionya yang audionya yang error. Okay. This one. This one. Ini ada ada si oh. Our theme today is global multi-stakeholder collaboration for achieving a safe, secure, and tolerant cyberspace, enabling growth and sustainable development in society. I participated in the 2013 Zoom conference on cyberspace, where I shared a vision for the future. This vision for cyberspace is driven to harvest information and communication technologies and the internet for accelerating the progress on millennium development goals and the post-2015 development agenda. Cyberspace is a critical role to play in improving the lives of all, particularly the most vulnerable, beyond the target place of the world's historic millennium declaration. This vision is directly linked to not only the Seoul Conference theme, which was the global prosperity for an open and secure cyberspace, opportunities, threats, and cooperation. It is also linked to the theme of the IGF, building bridges, enabling multi stakeholder cooperation for growth and sustainable development. And one could say this is an ends based approach to cyber ethics. Which is, an important, which is as important as the means-based approach to cyber ethics, one that concerns internet governments. The member states of the United Nations, together in Rio de Janeiro last year, for the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development of Europe last year. Together with their global partners, they identified economic, social, and environmental as the three main pillars of sustainable development. To realize the potential for growth and sustainable development, the international community needs to consider ethical principles to achieve safety, security, and tolerance in cyberspace. About safety, we agree that citizens of all countries should feel as safe in the online world as they do in the offline. Stop, stop, Public policies for cyberspace should be grounded in creating an online world that is free of criminal activity and malicious attacks. There needs to be a fundamental safeguard to protect the safety of all inhabiting the virtual space. On security, I have no doubt that the multi-stakeholder community will deliberate, will de deliberate where to find the right balance between individual freedom of expression and collective security. It will find common ground on some basic internet governance principles that will assure an open but secure cyberspace. The IGF, again this year, is the ideal platform to allow all stakeholders to express their concerns and to offer solutions on an equal footing. Paragraph 39 of the Treaty's Agenda points out 
the necessity to further promote, develop, and implement in cooperation with all stakeholders the global culture of cybersecurity as outlined in the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 5739 and other relevant national frameworks. This culture requires national action and increased international cooperation to strengthen security while enhancing the protection of personal information, privacy, and data. Hmm? Continued development of the culture of cybersecurity should enhance access and trade and must take into account the level of social and economic development of each country and respect the development oriented aspects of the information society. This paragraph signals the tolerance that needs to support the culture of cybersecurity. Today, and throughout the week, the multi stakeholder dialogue will help shape such a culture through promoting tolerance and openness. Closely linked to tolerance is inclusiveness. We can empower the most vulnerable populations, including those living in remote areas such as small island development states, to use ICT to, de to leapfrog previously unavoidable development hurdles. The third international conference on small island development states will be held next year. It will focus the most attention on the group of countries which you need a particular vulnerability. We can bring unique insights on how to assist these countries to prosper through cyberspace. In speaking about safety, security, and tolerance in cyberspace for growth and sustainable development, I have addressed three pillars of the work of the United Nations. As you know, they are peace and security, development, and human rights. To achieve global prosperity in cyberspace, it seems that we must craft cyber ethics towards these same aims. Peace and security, development, and human rights. Thank you. Where is it? Where did you go? Mr. Gus, thank you for your valuable remarks. And thank you also for giving reminding us of the relations to the study and the after the day study of the U.S. community and the world of the U.S. And the U.S. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite the podium of my speaker, Mr. Fadi Tiani from ICANN, to give us a speech. Mr. Fadi Tiani, please. Your Excellency, will be excellent, ladies and gentlemen, here. Good morning. It is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to personally thank this team and his team that have done a marvelous job. Thank you very much. We come together at a very special time. I look at the term cyberspace, and I think the term should be put together. There's no more cyberspace. There's one space. It's the space we live in. In Dubai, I was watching clients using the internet to call for a while. In Los Angeles, parking spaces. Tell your GPS where they're coming The world that we live in is now the cyber world. There's no difference. And therefore, the cyber world that has now been merged with our being needs to become the center of our being, to our planning together. To defend this value to all of us, economic value, it brought human development. It brought free expression. It brought creativity and innovation. And it continues to bring peace. And I say peace, yes, because so much divides us. But the internet brings us together. So many things are valued between us and other people. Mm -hmm. The internet, through understanding, through 
physical education in order to do that. The internet is a good force, and it's a force we should safeguard. In the last few months, oh, come on, yes, of course. things happened that started making the public less trusting the That's not good. It's not good. Because the public trust in the internet is extremely important. If we as a humanity start doubting that nature and its value, we take away something very important. Therefore, we come together in battle to safeguard the trust. Each one of us here should consider oneself a public steward of, of this trust. A public trust in the internet. Now, how do we do that? Where do we go? This week in we have a unique option to start to find a new way to the world. We have seen movements by some governments, organizations, such as the Monte Video State, the technical organizations, also in recent movement towards a new way of cooperation. An open, transparent, democratic, and equal way of cooperation. Where everyone has a voice. Where the only goal is to maintain the public trust in you. So I have all of us together to cooperate. We are going to do that. To be open to listen to each other and to consider all questions on how we can build together an internet where we are all equal in its cooperation and its development. Energize this process. We join you, governments, businesses, organizations, to energize the cooperation And I think this is the energizing cooperation. Not change the organization. Not change the organization and institutions that serve as well. But rather build and evolve and bring them to the place
begitu di stop habis itu mulai ngerekam lagi soalnya dia kan mikrofon biar suaranya gak masuk sana ya kenapa? oh keren tau mic jadi waktu itu kita bisa kita bisa kita bisa kita bisa
Apa pas di tempat Atikah bermusuhan? Cantik banget. Bisa
Deus vai lembrar da rede. Ao respeitar a vida se tem os técnicos e tornando inadmissíveis decisões comerciais, religiosas ou de qualquer outra natureza. E aqui eu já disse no Brasil, ao longo de quase 20 anos, temos experiências muito positivas em como lidar com as questões mais relevantes do planeta da internet. Seja isso, é um exemplo disso, com participação de empresas e empresas e da sociedade civil. Nossa proposta é colocar lado a lado líderes mundiais do setor empresarial, a sociedade civil e os governos nacionais, já desde a organização desse encontro até a construção das definições que conseguimos alcançar. Acreditamos ser possível sair de lá com compromissos claros de uma agenda comum e definida que aponte para as ações concretas a serem desenvolvidas por todos nós. E é isso que a gente tem que fazer para a gente estar em uma agenda de uma forma de agenda de uma forma 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 de uma forma. O Brasil traz para o ar o melhor de sua exposição com a cidade de Pujal. Esperamos aproveitar esta oportunidade para reforçar os laços da comunidade internacional da internet e apontar o horizonte melhor para todos. Que os próximos dias sejam bem sucedidos. Que saiamos daqui melhor do que se chegamos. Obrigado. I hope that uh, this day is very successful and that we need these things there and when they arrive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now we move forward to the families and would like to invite Mr. Mosafi Kutosisaki, Vice President for Policy and Communications, and this day of the Press and Communication of the Time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to thank the government of Indonesia for hosting this forum. I also want to tremendous the support of the IG and secretary members and the supporters for all of them this forum. It's my great pleasure to attend this forum. For the first time in two years since came to the global number of individuals using the internet nowadays is about the time it does not train of body. Yeah, yeah. Furthermore, the development of mobile communications, such as the spread of mobile phones and smartphones, is tremendous. The development of mobile 
applications make a deep input and open standards by various communities to access deep income. As a result, this development will inspire the volume of use of the internet on the world scale in the future. It's reported that the internet has contributed to 21% of economic growth of the advanced countries for the past five years. Coupled with the development of mobile communications as well as the facilitation of the use of communication of the internet. The further spread of the use of the internet keeps economic growth expanding on our world scale. The chance to be a part of this growth is often equal to the European countries and the developing countries. This is the result in the increase of the quality of the use of the internet. As a basis for social and economic development. it's important to ensure the quick goal of the integration in order to maximize the benefit that people can obtain on the internet. The quick flow of a wide variety of content in terms of culture and practice can lead to dynamism in innovation, which is essential for this process. In addition, in order for people to save the deep in that, it's also important to ensure security and privacy. Therefore, we are promoting research and development and inter international collaboration for early response to counter the threat of cyber attacks. We also have taken necessary measures to protect the privacy of uh, smartphone users. As I expressed at Antena, in light of the expansion of the volume of the use of the internet on a world scale, as well as the increase of the quality of use of the internet on the basis of social and economic activities, construction of a safe environment for use of the internet, and having the transparent and reliable of internet resources, what we call internet governance, because now uh, become increasingly important year by year. This is very important part. Concerning internet governance, it is necessary to consider a more specific way of governance. This consideration should be made not on the view of an individual or an individual business anymore, but on the view of humanity and the wider growth in some cases. It may be a mechanism to ensure accountability and transparency of dynamic at the higher level. In other cases, it may be the enhancement of getting much. In order to achieve this, cross border cooperation and government industry academic cooperation is essential. Value of each stakeholder in each country should be closer. It will be more important to make fundamental efforts to have a common view of the global community. One of the ways to effectively realize such an internet governance system may be by way of large stakeholders. In 2005, the United Nations General Assembly 
equipment and overall revenue of the implementation of government challenges and outcomes. This is this is in this context, IEG Cap will continue to drive a large growth in the future. We need to find the most specific way of internet governance through for e-participation, Europe Persia Express Gateway Project, establishing IT University, High Tech Park, State IT Fund, and Regional Data Center, and uh, Cyber Security Center, and particularly uh, trans Information Super Highway, TASIM Project, and establishment of the Eurasian Connectivity Alliance, Eureka. Availing this opportunity, I would like to thank all countries who supported the TASIM initiative in UN General Assembly uh, 68 session, which concluded with the adoption of resolution on establishing Eurasian Connectivity Alliance in September 2013. We believe that not only our country, but the whole region will benefit from Eureka. We consider the TASIM project as a major regional initiative aiming at creation of transnational fiber optic backbone targeting primarily the countries of Eurasia and accelerating of information flow, flow from Western Europe to China. In this regard, we look forward to your ideas as how ICT tool can be Harrison to advance sustainable development. Excellences, colleagues, in addition, I would like to cordially invite you all to the International Conference on Cybercrime Partnership, Problems and Perspective. That and the multi-stakeholders. Community, I see Abji, Haifos, Pandi, ICT Watch, just to name a few, that has made this even possible for the opportunity to be here today and for, to, and for hosting this event. It is a source of great pride that my country is embracing the IGF, and I am certain that this will be a very engaging week. The diverse representatives that are here today and who have been invited to speak demonstrate Indonesia's commitment to the multi-stakeholder model, to democracy, and to open debate and discussion. I am proud to be here and to have the opportunity to speak on behalf of Google. 
There are three topics that I would like to address. The first topic is the one that ties with the ethnic themes, that is surveillance. This topic is, as they say, the elephant in the room. It doesn't need to be. We should be able to discuss surveillance, individual freedoms, and civil liberty this week, and at every conference without taboo. I should disclose that surveillance is not my area of specialty. I joined Google only a few weeks, a few months ago, and came here from the Indonesian Trade Ministry. However, I've learned more about surveillance in the last six months than I have in the past 20 years. I've learned in recent months that surveillance is not limited to any single government. Although the press is currently focusing on the role of the U.S. government in the surveillance, this is by no means limited to the U.S. government. All of the internet stakeholders, governments, private companies, civil society, and the technical community must look inward to figure out what is the right answer and how to strike the right balance on this matter. We hope that the discussions about striking the balance of protecting users, civil liberties, and the government desire to protect its citizens can happen in the balanced global context. The second important point is turning on another trend that we are seeing in the global policy space, one that is sometimes related to surveillance, but not always. I am referring to the increased desires of governments globally to require that data be stored locally, sometimes it's being called data localization. This is a global issue that affects everybody, and it is a trend that we are seeing around the world. For example, there has been recently been discussions of creating a Schengen zone for data or multiple Schengen zones around the world. For those that don't know what Schengen zone is, it is an agreement between countries in Europe to allow for the free flow of people and goods across borders, and the free flow of people was a major historical accomplishment. The Iron Curtain is gone, but at one point, it cut right through the middle of many countries. Take an example of Berlin. At one point, the entire city was literally encircled with a physical wall that prevented flows of people, information, and commerce. It severed families and relationships from each other. When the, citizenship, when the citizens in East Berlin had enough, they destroyed the wall. And in fact, they took it apart so quickly and with so much passion that there was nothing left at all. If you travel to Berlin today to visit the wall, what you actually see is on the wall itself, but instead a rebuilt replica of it. European then move on to embrace the free flow of people among borders and sign the Schengen Treaty to guarantee it. Closer to home, there is a country of about 52 million people that is another democracy in the works. Our chairman, Eric Smith, recently some spent some time there, and while he was there, he had the opportunity to speak with some of the former political prisoners. They told him about how the internet is the thing that kept them going. While they were in prison, they knew that the world was watching and listening to their plights and struggle. When they were freed, it was the internet, the open and uncensored internet, that brought them up to speed with the world. Another ex example, still in Asia, is a country of about 25 million people where there is really no internet. The entire society in this country is essentially encircled by wall, just like Berlin until, 2000, until 1989. The control of all access and possibilities is the ways that the government keeps its people oppressed and behind the rest of the world economically. The Berlin Wall is in a perfect analogy, and admittedly is a bit provocative. But still, building a, building a Berlin Wall in the internet is wrong. Today we are seeing countries do this. It's not just authoritarian countries that are doing it. Some of the world's strongest democracies are also insisting on building internet islands and erecting walls. We're seeing this trend in many different places throughout the world. It is worrisome. And it is a topic that we should be able to discuss openly this week and be concerned about. Finding the right balance between the growth of the internet and the understandable request of many countries to have better infrastructure in their countries is an area of mutual interest. 
it won't be solved this week, but we can, and we should, listen to each other carefully and continue the dialogue in a positive way. My last point is about the IGF itself. As IGF enters its eighth year, it is time to look hard at the governance of the IGF itself and to make sure that we openly discuss how to make the IGF a stronger place for hard discussion like this. There are many things that the IGF can do to become stronger and to establish itself permanently in the space of internet governance, a place where we can all openly engage on really difficult topic. The IGF currently operates on a five-year cycle, yet internet governance is a permanent discussion. We are here today and this week as if the IGF is proceeding on the basis of business as usual. Sadly, this is not business as usual. Many people across the room work extremely hard to make sure that IGF happened this year. This has been an extraordinary, truly multi-stakeholders effort, and we thought looking back at what could have been done better, we should take the opportunity to look forward, to be introspective, and to think hard about how to make sure that the institution becomes stronger and continue thrives. There are many areas where the IGF can improve, and this is perhaps not the best setting here today to go into all those points. However, we hope that the discussion can take place this week in multiple fora. The main areas where we would like to discuss include some of the possible improvement that can make the IGF stronger, improving ability to fund the IGF, better transparency, to look at ways to improve the IGF own governance models and others. We hope that there will be opportunities this week to discuss this important topic to strengthen the IGF for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for your time. We look forward to engaging in this conversation as the week continues, and hopefully you will all have some time to enjoy the beautiful island of Bali. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Shinto, for your interesting uh, contributions. And it gives us, it gives and opens our mind to the value of cyberspace and its impact to our society. Now we move to our next panelist from PT Telkom Indonesia, Mr. Rizkan Chandra, the Director of Network and Solutions uh, from PT Telkom. We want to hear the insight and ideas from the largest telecom operator in Indonesia. What are the challenges towards a safe, secure, and tolerant cyberspace? Mr. Rizkan Chandra, please. Excellencies, distinguished co-chairs, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the host for this opportunity. And uh, let me briefly introduce uh, about uh, the company first. Uh, we are the largest telecommunication provider in Indonesia. We have uh, around 140 million customers, which uh, 55 million out of them are internet users. Uh, we are also listed in New York Stock Exchange, uh, London Stock Exchange, and Indonesia Stock Exchange. The good news is uh, we have a good, very high penetration of uh, mobile uh, phone in Indonesia, uh, both in local trip and also non-local trip areas. Uh, while the bad news is we still have a low penetration of uh, fixed broadband in uh, Indonesia. Uh, in order to that, we have promoted a program called Indonesia Digital Network, IDN 2015, Indonesia Digital Network 2015, uh, which also includes uh, the development of uh, around 20 million house pa home pass all over Indonesia, and also 1 million access point uh, Wi-Fi uh, all over Indonesia. On top of that, we also have Indonesia Digital Society, or we call it Indiso, which one of them is an Indie school, uh, which promotes connectivity to all schools in Indonesia. Uh, we have currently have uh, more than 30,000 schools in Indonesia uh, deployed by uh, ex uh, access point Wi-Fi all over Indonesia. Now let's get back to the business, to the uh, 
uh, objective for the internet, which I believe is to promote equality, tolerance, fairness, and openness. In order to achieve that, I think we shall get back also to the basic of the uh, internet. I would like to quote a thing from uh, Bill Clinton. It is dangerously destabilizing, destabilizing to have half of the world on the cutting edge of technology, while the other half still struggling on the bare edge of survival. And that led us back to the digital divide. The second is about public trust, and the third is, uh, like as stated by the uh, uh, main presenter, about uh, cultivating global while maintaining local. So I would like to address first about the digital divide. I think the case for uh, uh, Indonesia and uh, other developing countries is about more healthy and appropriate internet business platform, which may contribute to uh, the digital divide problem that uh, developing countries are still experiencing. Uh, the second, about the public trust. Uh, from telco point of view, certification, be it local or global, on infrastructure and content, of course, uh, in internet era, is not in the form of license, but it is a voluntary certification, including also Telco's role to validate prepaid users, which happen to be dominate in most Asian market, including Indonesia. And uh, those two, I believe, would lead to promote local content, which may uh, prevent the cultivating global and maintaining uh, local, which I mentioned previously. And uh, with those three in mind, the digital divide, public trust, and cultivating global, maintaining local, uh, along with the suggestions on a more healthy and appropriate internet business platform for infrastructure and content, and also a certification on infrastructure and content, and promoting local content, I believe we are getting near to the better world. And that shall conclude my comment. Telkom Indonesia Group look forward to engaging more in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Riskan Chandra, for your valuable contributions. Now we will move toward the next panelist, and I would like to invite Ms. Lynn Mary. President and CEO of ISOC, Internet Society, to deliver her comments. Ms. Lynn Mary, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in order to ensure that a precedent wasn't inadvertently set, um, I will speak from my speak seat, which is also certainly a more equitable position. So it's my pleasure to join you today in this lovely country and to thank the Indonesian government for hosting this event. So I'd like to discuss the pivotal role of global multi-stakeholder collaboration in achieving a safe, secure, and tolerant cyberspace. But first, let's take a quick look at what safe, secure, and tolerant means in the context of the Internet. The open and global nature of the Internet, built on fundamental principles of open standards, voluntary collaboration, reusable building blocks, integrity, permissionless innovation, and global reach, amongst others, has enabled astonishing social and economic advancement in ways that we never could have imagined. At the same time, the Internet, like many other good things, is not without risk. It is important, though, to appreciate that while malicious actors will exploit any opportunity, the Internet's key characteristics are neither the origin nor the cause of the malicious activity. By and large, there is no such thing as absolute safety and security. There will always be threats, so our concept of safe and secure should reflect that reality. We need to think about secure in terms of residual risks that are considered acceptable in a specific context. And we must recognize the inherent escalating nature of threats to security. 
Tolerance is not a word often heard in internet governance dialogue, perhaps because it is different and sometimes inconsistent connotations across stakeholders and communities. Being open, though, is heard much more frequently. The open, decentralized, borderless nature of the internet has allowed non-traditional and sometimes disruptive opinions and ideas to more easily cross communities, countries, and regions. These can be confronting, particularly to societies unaccustomed to unreserved statements of opinion. It is sometimes human nature to push away things that are different, new, or contrary to our thinking. But if, as a global community, we truly wish to be tolerant, we must accept that everyone may not share the same views, and importantly, the diversity of opinion and the opportunity for discussion and debate, such as that offered through the IGF, provides greater opportunity for creativity and, innov and invention. At the same time, tolerance demands that when we express our opinions, we are mindful of the impact they might have, respectful of the rights of others, and thoughtful in how they are delivered. Openness, tolerance, and trust are all very important for effective, sustainable policy development. Not all stakeholders are as well or equally equipped to contribute their opinions and ideas, whether through lack of resources, language, or otherwise. Some may prefer more formal interactions, while others are more comfortable in a less formal environment. Multi-stakeholder collaboration aims to bridge the differences so that everyone can contribute effectively and thereby offer the world better opportunities and better decisions. The highly publicized, covert, government-sanctioned surveillance activities are alarming and are a major threat to trust, which is particularly fundamental in cyberspace. The Internet must be a trusted channel for secure, reliable, private communication between users. One of the key building blocks for that trust is respect for internationally recognized data protection standards. Actions that undermine that trust, such as systematic surveillance, threaten to disrupt natural, economic, and social interactions that are the foundations for sustained global prosperity. Now more than ever, it is imperative that the international community strengthens cooperation to ensure that appropriate policies are collaboratively developed and fairly implemented and that restrictive or harmful policies are not pursued. Tough and controversial issues should be debated in the open. In closing, the citizens of the world deserve and will demand a global and open platform for communication built on solid foundations of security and privacy. Therefore, we must work together to find solutions that give that to each and every one of us. And we need to restore the principles and relationships of trust upon which the global Internet has been built. The IGF meeting this week will provide an excellent opportunity for all stakeholders to discuss how best to restore these principles. Finally, Returning to more traditional roles for governments and policymakers is unlikely to be adequate to restore these principles or to restore trust, particularly given this is how such pervasive surveillance flourished in the first place. To be clear, we are not saying no role for governments, but we are asking everyone to look to the future and move very thoughtfully as a lot is at stake. We need to look very carefully at the decentralized, distributed nature of the Internet and its management and development, as it has given the world so very much and has shown its robustness and scalability time and time again. We should not throw that out in response to the current set of threats or desires of some. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Lynn Mary. The next panelist is Mr. Paul Wilson, who is the Director General of APNIC that looks after the Asia-Pacific area for, for the NIC. Mr. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, uh, Your Excellency, Minister Titiful Sembering, uh, honor Honorable ICT Ministers from all over the world and all of the other excellent people who are here. We've come a long way to be in Bali, and for me it's a huge honor to be sitting here as a panelist in this high-level leaders' meeting. It's a great thing, actually, that this meeting has been constructed uh, as a multi-stakeholder event in the true spirit of WISIS, 
the spirit of the IGF coming up and of the internet itself. So, Mr Minister, I'd like to thank you not just for your kind hospitality but for extending it to everyone who's in this, uh, in this room. A big thank you needs to go also to the Indonesian IGF organising community, which is uh, in itself a multi-stakeholder group. Uh, it's supported the ministries in, in, in Indonesia to make this IGF happen, and that's been a huge effort in itself. I think a great achievement, actually, to have an IGF which is maybe for the first time fully organised by a local multi-stakeholder community uh, for us, the global multi-stakeholder community. Thank you. So when I saw the title of this meeting, a multi-stakeholder collaboration for achieving a safe, secure and tolerant cyberspace, I couldn't help but relate it to the vision of APNIC, uh, the organisation that I've been leading for some time now. Our own vision is for a global, open, stable and secure internet that serves the entire Asia-Pacific community. And it's clear how this vision maps almost directly to the theme of the high-level uh, meeting. For the APNIC community, both of these expressions represent what we aim for in building the internet across the Asia-Pacific. You may know APNIC is a technical uh, organisation that distributes uh, essential internet resources, primarily uh, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. Like many of the uh, others in the, in the technical community, we're a cooperative organisation. We work together as a community and also as part of a much broader community to support the development of the internet. When we think about cyber ethics, uh, I think most of us here would think about human behaviours on the network, uh, privacy, intellectual property, freedom of information and human rights, etc. And these are things that at first sight may have not much to do with IP addressing. But we are all part of the internet governance ecosystem. We're all in this together, we share a vision, and I think we're actually united by some fundamental ethics, uh, which I'd like to talk about now. Since the WISIS, we've heard a lot about internet governance. It's an important concept. It refers to a whole range of activities, uh, but in a sort of objective way. It refers to what we all do uh, technically, but to me what's missing is how internet governance happens. The dynamics, the actions, and also the ethics which guide internet governance processes. Many of you may have seen a recent statement from the leaders and chairs of internet uh, technical organisations. Uh, we met in Uruguay just a couple of weeks ago and produced something that we called the Montevideo Statement. And in this statement we use a different term, a concept of internet cooperation. And what internet cooperation represents is, I think, internet governance in action. It encompasses the ideas of internet governance and of enhanced cooperation. It refers to co cooperation, of course, but it's cooperation in the internet realm, which is very special. It's very specific because it's absolutely open and multi-stakeholder by its nature. And cooperation exists across society and governance as well. At APNIC, uh, we know APEC through our involvement as a guest in APEC Tel. And what I've seen is that the C in APEC is very meaningful. It refers to a kind of progressive engagement by people who choose to work together for a common good. In cooperation, I think it's not so important to agree on everything, but instead find enough agreement to simply work together. And in internet terms, for those who know a bit of history, it's exactly the same idea as the old mantra of rough consensus and running code. So I think in these times of change, the, inter the IGF needs to strike a balance to provide continuity for this discussion on internet governance and also to adapt with the times. And one change that I'd like to see is the adoption of, of cooperation as an ethic of the IGF, even as part of its name, because cooperation is an ethic of the internet and it's a very potent human ethic as well. Just a few other things uh, that I'd like to mention from this statement uh, from Montevideo. One of them is the importance at this particular time of regaining trust in the internet, the trust that users have started to lose after learning about pervasive surveillance programs undertaken by various governments. The architecture of the internet, including its uh, global integrity, its protocols, its standards, it is robust enough to keep building the internet as an essential element of our lives, but the recent re revelations have reminded us that we can't take the internet for granted. Second is the importance of a unique, integrated, cohesive internet and avoiding the, cor the corresponding risk of nationally fragmented internets. Thirdly, 
We mentioned the importance of an international oversight, a global oversight, meaning that no single government with a special role uh, exists with respect to internet governance issues. All stakeholders, and all, including all governments, participate on an equal footing. The fourth element in the statement establishes that, th that uh, the deployment of IPv6 should continue to be a global priority, and that's a subject which as you may know, has got a lot of importance for the technical community, but it's also important to restore the end-to-end -end connectivity, the global uniformity of the internet, and that's a critical key today to maintaining the open, stable and neutral internet, uh, the internet that we all know and love and that we want to continue. So I mention all of these things in the recent statement because I think they're very important. Uh, their full realisation in the years to come will require a lot of effort and commitment from this community. Uh, in summary, it's the regaining of trust, the maintenance of a global, stable and international internet, swiftly moving to IPv6, last, not, last uh, not least. Uh, in conclusion, to uh, honourable ministers and the members of, of this community, the internet's a global platform that crosses over jurisdictional, geographical and national boundaries. Any initiative taken at a national level or a local level on the internet can have a global impact. And hence the importance of cooperation, a framework for internet cooperation, or even as Fadi Chihadi said himself, an energised cooperation for the internet. IGF can, can help to take national and regional discussions to a global space and have a dialogue that is not insular but global and cooperative, as is the internet itself. The IGF is unique. Uh, the fact that we're here for the eighth year running shows clearly that it remains important to many, many people. That reflects the importance of the internet itself, as we heard from speakers this morning. And I believe that while the internet continues to grow and to create challenges for all of us, there's going to be a role for the IGF, and that is for the, for the foreseeable future. At APNEC, we placed a lot of effort this year to support the global IGF happening on our side of the world here in Bali. It's great to have this level of enga engagement at this very interesting time. We probably haven't seen these, uh, these sorts of times since uh, in all the days of the, of the World Summit on Information Society. And I trust that we face uh, this new era. These good times for the internet are in full cooperation mode and in the full spirit of internet cooperation. The regaining of trust, the maintenance of a global, stable and secure internet and IPv6. These should be things that we could all easily cooperate on and share as a common vision. Thank you very much and I'd like to attempt uh, something local. Teramakasi dan salamat bediskusi di IGF. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, now we move forward to the next panelist, and I would like to invite Mr. Ronald Dybert, Director of Citizen Lab, to give his comments. Mr. Dybert, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm honored to be here representing the Citizen Lab and my colleagues at, of the Cyber Stewards Network, of which we're a part uh, here at the high-level leaders meeting. I'm going to begin my presentation with an E-word, not ethics, Edward. That's right, Edward Snowden. I know in bringing this up, I know in bringing his name up, I'm making many people in this room uncomfortable. It makes governments uncomfortable for the obvious reasons. It makes some in private sector uncomfortable. Data we entrust to them that we assumed was protected based on the terms of service we sign with them have, it turns out, routinely been shared with third parties without our consent. How often this goes on among other com companies and in other parts of the world without user consent is an open question that we at Citizen Lab intend to explore. We have to address it because as the representative from Google said, it is the elephant in the room. Everyone here is wondering, 
what impact will these revelations have on forums like the IGF, on standard-setting bodies like the IETF, and on internet governance broadly? We are clearly at a watershed moment. My own fear is that the reactions to these revelations are in the short term going to make matters worse, will have a negative impact on openness, human rights, and even international security as governments detach and seek to insulate themselves. I worry that programs for a clean, healthy, or even an ethical internet will be used in practice to stifle free expression and access to information. I worry that what started out as a globally distributed network will be slowly subsumed and swallowed up by a system of nationalized controls. Although I applaud efforts by governments to build confidence and norms in cyberspace, I worry that these processes will result in a condominium of the lowest common denominator, as long as it is a process undertaken behind closed doors and without the full participation of civil society. I worry most of all about an escalating arms race in cyberspace, serviced by a growing market for censorship, surveillance, and computer network attack products and services that are directed by governments, not only at each other, but also at their own citizens and dissidents at home and abroad. Capabilities are being put in the hands of policymakers that they never before imagined. Deep packet inspection, cell phone tracking, social network monitoring that are being used to identify, isolate, and arrest civil society. I fear the market for digital arms, unconstrained as it is, will now explode as cybersecurity demands grow and governments seek their own signals intelligence capabilities. So what to do about all of this? Some of my colleagues in civil society feel that we should take the internet back, that we should bypass governments and the private sector altogether because they can no longer be trusted. But I believe that is not only impossible, it is undesirable. Without organized government, without the rule of law, the very rights we cherish would quickly diminish in a Hobbesian world of might makes right. I believe that civil society needs to put forward a security strategy for cyberspace from the starting point of human rights and the rule of law. We have to begin by asking security for whom and security for what. Part of that must include a rational and open discussion of the role of law enforcement and intelligence agencies in the world of big data and the Internet of Things. At the very time we are turning over our digital lives inside out, entrusting our own thoughts, actions, and intimate communications to private companies, we are delegating power and authority to secure this space to some of the world's most secretive and unaccountable national security agencies. To be clear, Law enforcement and intelligence are essential to the protection of commerce, governance, and human rights. But wholesale surveillance without judicial oversight is incompatible with liberal democracy and human rights. We have to give meaning in the real world to the idea of multi-stakeholderism. The term is mouthed so often by those who don't practice what they preach that has become an empty euphemism that has to change outside of the IGF. Finally, we have to lift the lid on the internet and subject it from the top to the bottom, from the code all the way to forums like this, subject them to greater oversight, transparency, accountability, and legal restraint. The internet is ours, all of ours. It is what we make of it. We need to remember that before it slips through our grasp. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Debert, for the interesting f contributions. Next, I would like to invite our next panelist, this 
MS Anja Kovax, the project director of Internet Democracy, and MS Kovax, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, um, and good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and especially Your Excellency, Mr. Tifatul Sembering, uh, for hosting the meeting and also for uh, allowing me to contribute here and make some remarks from the perspective of people, not just Internet users, but people in general. There were three aspects of the title for this event that I would like to touch on. The first one is cyber ethics. Um, what immediately came to mind when I saw that phrase was the, the title of an article that a colleague of mine recently wrote, in which she asked, are we moving towards a system of accountability without power? Not power without accountability, but accountability without power, as those who do not have power are increasingly pushed towards being responsible and accountable without rights being put against that. Cyber ethics is essentially about norms and principles. That's appropriate when it comes to uh, ideas about how to steer internet governance, how to take decisions about internet ar architecture, perhaps also to further guide the behavior of governments and businesses. But for users, norms and principles are actually a step down from a framework that we already have to ensure a safe, secure, and tolerant internet, which is that of human rights. Asking for responsibility and accountability without providing strong protection for human rights actually undermines those rights. And rather than emphasizing ethics, what we should emphasize and teach is a mutual respect for human rights. What we see at the moment, and let's examine this in some more detail, is a lack of balance. The issues of accountability and uh, uh, responsibility especially are pushed on users frequently when it comes to freedom of expression. And references then made to hate speech to emphasize the importance of these norms. As an organization coming from India, where recently 50, almost 50 people died in riots or, uh, caused by content that was spread on the internet, this is clearly a concern for us as well. But all too often, while restrictions might be legitimate in some cases, we see that responsibility and accountability are words that are simply used to reinforce restrictions on freedom of expression that are not necessarily legitimate. Um, and that do not take into account the fact that freedom of expression is embedded in a network of rights that are interlocked and that require each other in order to be enjoyed and exercised. Because this emphasis on the interconnectedness of rights is not made, it's not possible anymore to see where to draw the line. Thresholds need to be in place when restrictions on free speech are put into place. And it has to be remembered that the right to shock, disturb, and offend is not an unpleasant after effect, but an integral part of human rights and of the right to freedom of expression. What we need then, if we want to strengthen free speech and curb hate speech, uncomfortable speech, is more speech, first of all, and non-legal measures by states, as exemplified in much of the work of UNESCO, for example, to strengthen freedom of expression. Censorship always benefits the status quo and not people's empowerment. While the powerless are called on uh, to be responsible and accountable, unfortunately, it has become clear in recent times that we cannot have the same expectation of governments and businesses as their lack of commitment, or so it seems from users' perspective at least, to a safe and secure internet indicates. The narrative of cybersecurity intermeshes a number of debates. It goes from cybercrime, including spam and cyber uh, pornography, over critical internet infrastructure to national security. And in the context of the latter, surveillance is often upheld as a solution. But surveillance and security actually frequently contradict each other as surveillance exploits the very vulnerabilities that should be patched to make the Internet secure. By not drawing on the human rights framework, security debates does do little to further security from the perspective of users and give strongly the impression that the debate is not really about security, but about control, in particular control of people. 
How do we then move forward if safety is really a concern? First of all, to protect the public interest, it is crucial that human rights are protected in their interconnections. This is what is needed before we move to the framework of cyber ethics. In addition, multi-stakeholderism is essential as well. This is not a matter of ethics, but a matter of democracy. Over the past few years, we have seen a strong push in internet governance to move towards more multilateralism and greater government interference in the uh, governance of the internet, often guided by traditional ideas of sovereignty. But the internet is a global network, it's not a national one, and it is often owned by private actors, not by governments, which makes the architecture of the internet and the environment very different from what we are used to offline. Concepts of sovereignty obviously will continue to be relevant, but they have to be reimagined. Sovereignty as it predated the internet cannot continue to exist. We have to be aware of the interconnections between states as much as between rights, and the impact that decisions in one country have on people in another. The different architectures from the internet also means that checks and balances as we know them in the offline